All right, Mark chapter 16, and we're down to verse number 7. So we're going to pick up there and looking at some things here. And again, uh, Mark, we're, getting, we're in the resurrection of Christ. Um, verse 5, and entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrightened. And we looked last time at that issue of the angels there. There's two of them. One is sitting out front on the stone. One is inside at the head of the, of the grave clothes on the right-hand side here. Uh, the, the, the angels are going to talk to the ladies. Verse 6, and he saith unto them, be not affrightened. By the way, Mark here does not focus in on the Lord and, his re and the resurrection and so forth. We see that in Matthew, Luke, and John. Here, Mark is focusing in on the impact of it all on the disciples, on his followers. And really, the impact is going to be on in the, and focus in on the issue of their unbelief. As we go down through here, we'll see that. So the angels, uh, verse 5, a young man. Uh, the angels were all created in, in creation, Genesis 1, 1. And uh, what you have there, so you have a, you have a guy a little over 4,000 years old, and he's called a young man. So obviously their appearance is of, a, of a, at least a 33-year-old, if you keep the number, the perfect generation number and everything. But here he is 4,000-plus years later, and he's considered a young man. Uh, angels carry on the appearance of men, Revelation 20, uh, one, uh, 21 or 22. I just had says, and it's uh, Revelation 21 and verse 17, according to the measure of a man that is of the angels. So angels are, uh, they, they look like men. They're not winged. Uh, there are component, are, are uh, angelic creatures that are winged, the cherubims, the seraphims, uh, the ladies in uh, Ezekiel that are called wicked. They're winged. So these guys, the angels do not look like they're not long-haired and feminine-looking. You know, I always think about Fabio on top, on front of the romance novels back in the day, you know. They don't look anything like that at all. Actually, if an angel came and appeared into here, we would all faint. We'd just all pass out. Uh, and, and, and how you know that is really when they rolled away the stone, what happened to the, the centurion and the guards? They all passed out as dead men, you know. So that's kind of how you would think about it. Uh, the angels are in the room. They are around us because they're in the spirit realm. And uh, we've studied the angels uh, in the past. So in verse 6, he saith unto them, Be not affrightened. Now, they're afraid. So then what calms their fear? Well, it's what, he's, what the angel is going to say to them. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. He's risen. That's the declaration. Then he says, he's not here. Well, why isn't he here? He's not here because he is risen. But now, that's that declaration of there's, this is not a hoax. This is not somebody walked in and stole his body. This isn't the thing that the theologians came up later called the swoon idea. And that is on the cross, he just passes out. And when they laid him in the cool of the tomb, he revived and then snuck out when they, ro when they rolled the, the, the stone away. You know, it's none of that at all. Rather, again, he doesn't pass out. The reason that he's not here he, is he's risen and it's just like he said. If you look at verse 7, But go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall he see him as he said unto you. And that's the issue here. As he said, just like he told you guys that, the tomb, that he was going to go die, be buried, and then resurrect on the third day, that's what's happening here. So the empty tomb is proof. And it's a demonstration of his resurrection. He said he would be resurrected, and he is. Come, look at where they laid him. Uh, if you come over to John 20, um, hold on to Luke, or I'm sorry, Mark. If you look at John 20, 
John 20, um, verse uh, 6. Then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and seeth the linen cloths lie and the napkin that was about his head not lying with the linen clothes but wrapped together in a place by itself. You see, when he resurrected, it's not like Lazarus where they had to undo him. He just literally came out of the grave clothes so that you saw the grave from shoulder to feet, that wrap, and then you see the napkin, the, the wrap around the head that they put, and that's laying here, and it's separated by the, you know, it, and it's just like he just got right up out of them, which is what he did. So when you come back to Mark 16, the angel calms their fear. Hey, they are there, and they're in sorrow. They're the turmoil of the emotions of losing their loved one, losing their hope, losing their Messiah, losing everything that they thought he was. They, again, they're, they're not registering the unbelief. I'm, I'm sorry, the resurrection. They're not believing it. They're, they're working through it. And so he says, you guys seek Jesus. You're in the right place. These ladies know where they've, rolled, they've laid him. Back up in the end of chapter 15, they, they know there's a stone there. They're, at, they're make, ill-prepared. Who's going to roll the stone away from it? And they get there, and they're just shaken to the core. So he calms them. Then in verse 7, which is where we're going to pick up here, then he says, but go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him as he said unto you. Go, tell the disciples, tell the little flock, everybody, but go tell Peter, and it's Mark. Every, you go, everything he said has happened, and it's Mark and Mark alone that draws out Peter specifically. The other ones just say, go tell everybody, but Mark, they say, here it is, you go tell Pete, and there's a reason for it here in Mark. Now, what begins to happen when we get into Mark 16? We'll talk about some of this next time as well. The new Bibles come in, and they say from verse 9 to the end shouldn't be in there. And then they've got their, the oldest manuscripts, the two most ancient manuscripts, Sinaitic and Vatican, don't have it. Well, they don't tell you about the 600 other manuscripts that do have it, see? They don't tell you about that. And they, they go back to this. And so 600 have it and two don't have it. I think we got a problem here, see. So when you think about what's happening here, so then they come up with this idea about Mark mentioning Peter. And what they do is they come in and they say, see, Mark is really just a collection of sermons that he put together for Peter. Because Peter's illiterate. Peter can't read. Peter can't write. Peter, you know, and all this stuff. And they just dump all over Peter. And, you know, come, come over to Acts 4. And, but if you think about Peter, Peter's a commercial fisherman. So Peter understands finance. So he's got to understand math. He understands contracts and quotas and everything business-wise. He's not illiterate. Actually, what's going to happen, uh, look, at, look at Acts 4 and verse 13. Here's the verse that they use, by the way. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. You see the unlearned and ignorant so they say, see, he's illiterate, but, you know, he wouldn't know anything. So Mark is just collect up stuff. That's why Mark is so brief in the accounts. It's Mark's notes, and he's, he's doing it for Peter. They'll even go as far as saying that he's actually copying down what Peter preached, and Peter told him to write this like Paul has uh, uh, Tertius and the, the secretary and everything and all that. And, and they, but the ignorance here in Acts 4, what the leadership of Israel is saying of Peter is they didn't go to our school. They didn't, they didn't graduate from such and such university here. If, if you come over to John 7, by the way, I've had this set of me, so I'm in pretty good company. 
when you think about, look at John 7. John 7, verse 14. John 7, 14. Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? See, he didn't go to our school. We didn't, what, what was his graduating class? I had a guy ask me, what school did you go to? I said, well, I, School of Hard Knocks? I don't know. I didn't go to school. I, I went to Grace School of the Bible. That would have been it if you need a school name. And he's like, oh, so you don't understand eschatology. I'm like, what is that? I don't know the big words, you know. So I'd actually, he's like, end time, study of end times. I go, oh, yeah, I do. What do you want to talk about? Oh, well, are you pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib? I'm pre, well, I'm Pauline, you know, and, and he's like, how do you know all this? I go, because I study, <laughs> you know. Well, do you know the Greek? Do you know the Greek? He's like, well, yes, I do. I said, all right, read it. He pulled out his Bible. It's got Greek and English. I said, don't read the English. Read the Greek. He couldn't do it. And I'm like, so you're no better than me, but, but I'm in the company of the Lord. I'm in the company of Peter. Guess what? I'm in the company of our apostle Paul as well, because what do they say? His, his letters are mighty, but his appearance is weak, and he's rudimentary, you know, and all that and stuff in 2 Corinthians. So they use Peter, and by the way, if you come over to 1 Peter 5, they use that ignorant and, and illiterate thing. Again, the leadership isn't saying he's dumb, stupid, can't read, can't write. The leadership of Israel is saying he didn't go to our seminary. He didn't go to our school, and when I was in uh, high school, I went to a Baptist high school in, in, there in, in, in Schaumburg Christian School. They were affiliated with Bob Jones back in the day. So guess where everybody went? Bob Jones. I was a rebel because I went to Pensacola Christian College, the baby Bob Jones, they called it back then, a Becca books and all that stuff. I went there for a year because I got a free ride. <laughs> I got a scholarship, and they're like, come. And I'm like, cool. You know, so I go down, and I was there to, to uh, get in, uh, understand the TV stuff and everything like that. So I wasn't there to learn how to be a preacher boy or anything. I had that at home. I didn't need that, you know, that other. But the thing is, is he didn't go where we send our people. That's what he's talking about. Now, if you look at 1 Peter 5, here's where they get this, uh, this idea as well. By so, Verse 12. 1 Peter 5, 12. By Silvanus, a faithful brother unto you, as I suppose, I have written briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God wherein ye stand. By Silvanus, a faithful brother unto you, as I suppose, I have written. Silvanus obviously helped Peter write 1 Peter, dictation. So they say, see, Peter couldn't write, so he had to get a guy to help him, so, and that's what Mark is. And that's where they say the book of Mark is really a collection of sermons and notes that Mark took from Peter's preaching and teaching. And uh, literally, they do everything. Now, all of that means absolutely nothing except to move away from what's happening in the text of Mark 16. Okay? By the way, Romans 16, 22, Paul has... Uh, Emeritus, the dictate, the secretary idea, Tertius, and he used that quite a bit. It's not that Peter is illiterate. He's not at all. Uh, so when you come back here to 16, verse 7, there's some wonderful things happening here as we go through this section in that Mark is going to write some things here with a... With a with the understanding that the reader already has the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of John. So the other thing is everybody says John's writings are late, A.D. 90, and that's not true at all. If you read John, John doesn't talk as in past back there. He talks in present right now. The book of the Revelation, they say, see, it's always that back over there, you know, after you know, A.D. 70, right, right, right. They no. Paul makes references to it as early as Galatians. So there's references to this early. So you just got to listen to that and go, okay, you know, that's just something somebody told somebody to tell. 
when you get them in the scripture, it's just not always the case. So what Mark is going to do, and we'll see it as we go down through here, is Mark is literally written after Luke and John it, from, from the way it appears, okay? In that, Mark is going to bring up Mary Magdalene and the two on the road to Dema uh, uh, Aramaeus. So what do you need to know? You need to know John 20 and you need to know Luke 24 because those two passages fill in all the detail. Follow? So Mark is, is he's requiring the reader, the little flock here, to understand Luke and John to get what he's going to make reference to. So it seems to me that Luke and John had to be written before Mark because of his, he's expecting the reader to know Mary Magdalene and the two on the road. Now, we'll get there in just a minute, but uh, chapter six, 16, verse 7. But go thy way, tell his disciples. So you're going to go tell them. You're going to go take the message out to the little flock. What's the message? He's not here. He's risen. Okay? So go tell them. Then he adds... Peter. Now, notice it's not Simon Peter. It's Peter. And then, so the question then is, is, okay, why does Mark say, the angel says to the ladies, you go and tell Peter. Well, what did Peter just do to the Lord? He denied him three times. Okay? He's come over here. If you come back into chapter 14, and by the way, 6, 7, 16, 7, that he goeth before you into Galilee, there shall you see him as he said unto you. And that's really the lynch in this. P think about Peter. Peter has denied the Lord three times, goes out, weeps bitterly. Everything's lost. He's, he's just defeated. And the angel says, Mary, Magdalene, Mary, you, got, you go tell the disciples, but you tell Peter to go meet him in Galilee, as he told you. Now look back at Mark 14. Now this is why we spent time going through this stuff in Mark 14. Mark 14, verse 26. We're in the upper room. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the night, went out into the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, Zechariah 13, 7, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. So what's happened? The shepherd's been smitten. He's been killed. And what's happened to the sheep? They've scattered. Just, you go tell the scattered sheep, the disciples out there, he is risen, and you especially get Peter. Verse 28, but after that I am risen. See how he's, I'm risen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go die. I'm going to be buried. The death, the death certificate confirms the death. By the way, the burial confirms the death because you don't bury live people. You bury dead people. I've risen, verse 28, I will go before you into Galilee. See, there it is. As he said, what did he tell you guys? He told them. I'm going to Galilee. I'll meet you in Galilee. Now, what does Peter do? But Peter said unto him, Although all shall be offended, yet will not I. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto you, unto thee, that this day, even the, in this night, before the cock crow tw twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter says, I'm not going to do it. And, and the Lord says, Yes, you are. Verse 31, but he spoke the more vehemently, if I should die with thee, I will not deny thee in any wise. Likewise also said they all. Peter stomped his foot and said, no, I'm not going to deny you. And we looked at that, and I'll just remind you that Peter, full of himself, self-confident that he would love the Lord to the end, and yet what ended up happening? He denied him. And what literally, if you look down at verse 72, that thing in Luke when the Lord walks across the porch there from Ananias to Caiaphas' house, 
and Peter denied him that third time, and the Lord just looked at him, didn't have to say a word or anything. Verse 72, and the second time the cock crew, Peter called to mind the word that Jesus said unto him. What, what broke the self-arrogance? What broke the... He remembered the word of Christ. Behold, before the cock crowed twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went, and when he thought thereon, he wept. Luke says he wept bitterly. So Peter has been, out, come over to Luke 22. Peter, because of his, he, he's got broken pride. He's been, he's devastated. Luke, Luke 22. He's devastated, and in the devastation, see, the angel tells the ladies, you go tell the scattered sheep, but you, better, you make sure you tell Peter, because Peter's the head of the 12. He's the leader, but right now, no confidence, no self nothing. He's been destroyed because he's denied the Lord. That's why in John, when he talks about Peter, Peter and John run to the to the tomb, John's kind of standing back. Peter just goes right in. You know, why? Because, hey, I, I, I deny, only thing on Pete's mind is I've denied him. I disobey. I let this happen. And that gets back to the whole thing in the garden where he's defending the Lord and the Lord's like, just surrenders. And in Peter's mind, you, we don't surrender. Why are we surrendering? And it all comes from a, from a place of unbelief. And that's going to be important here. Uh, Luke 22, uh, verse 28. Uh, Ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations, and I appoint unto you a kingdom as my Father hath appointed unto me, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So, Here's the Lord. He's been preparing them, preparing the 12, the little flock, for future ministry. During the 70th week of Daniel, tribulation, he's not preparing them for the dispensation of grace, for the church of the body of Christ, for the apostle Paul, for none of that. He's preparing them to be the head of the nation of Israel in the kingdom. That's why there are 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes. Here's the governmental structure of my kingdom, and you guys need to get ready for it, and here you are. Now, look at verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, now we're back to his old life. Simon, Simon, Simon bar Simon Peter, that's the, his original, his old flesh name, his old life, okay? Then, his, 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 by the way, his, I'm going to call you Peter. Because you're going to be in charge, Matthew 16. You're going to be the rock. You're going to be the char in charge of what's happening here. You're going to be the head guy. We're going to have 12 of you and all of that. He says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as we, the plural, second person there, you and ye. So who are we? he's not talking about just Peter, he's talking about who? The whole, the group, the little flock. But I have prayed for thee, Peter, singular second person, you, Pete, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brother. The conversion here is not his faith in Christ as Messiah, his justification. The conversion here is, is really literally a... Peter has fallen away, if you will. He's learning something about himself that he can't trust himself. He's very confident. He's very self-aware. He, he, Peter is, he's denied the Lord. I, I'll never let him hit you. And, and then he turns and denies. See, he was, Pete's, Pete's always looking for a fight. He's always looking to get into it. So the conversion here is a converting from the broken heart. It's, I'm no, I'm the, when thou art converted. In other words, Peter, when you get to the point where you decide you're not going to trust yourself anymore, your own energies, your own abilities, okay, when you get there, now go strengthen the brethren. 
So when you come back to, to Mark 16, the, the picture here, Peter, that moment of, well, the verse says conversion, restoration, is really a reinstatement of Peter to his position as head over the twelve. And he, he has a, a moment of losing confidence in himself. And in that moment, he comes to understand that he's got to trust Christ's word. I, when I heard the word, he remembered the word of Jesus, he wept bitterly. See, So Peter here, in, very in, in verse 7, tell his disciples, there's a little flock, but you go tell Peter specifically that he goeth before you into Galilee. Now, why Galilee? All right? We've all heard the preachers preach, and they say, come back to Matthew 4, and they say, Jerusalem is your hometown. Do you know that when he said to those guys in Acts there, Acts 1, you're going to start in Jerusalem, that none of those guys were from Jerusalem? It, Jerusalem was not their hometown. Where was, their hometown was up north in Galilee of the Gentiles. Every time I look on a map, Jerusalem is sitting over in the Middle East. And I know what they say. Jerusalem's your hometown. Judah's your state, your county. You know, Israel's your country and all this. And go out there and pull. And it's great sentiment, but it's not what Scripture's talking about. Matthew 4. I'm going to meet you guys into Galilee. Why Galilee? Well, that's where he called the little flock from. Eleven of the twelve are from Galilee. The only one from Jerusalem was Judas Iscariot, and he turned out to be the devil. Matthew 4, verse 12. Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. So in Matthew 4, 12, where does the Lord go? Galilee. Now hold on there real quick. Come over to 19, Matthew 19, and look at verse 1. 19, 1. And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came into the coast of Judea beyond Jordan, and now he's on his way into Jerusalem to die. So his ministry predominantly, back to Matthew 4, is in Galilee. Verse 13, it just, it's interesting. You know, and he goes in, and he doesn't leave until it's time to go to die. So he's going into Galilee, into that northern territory. You remember Jeroboam, Rehoboam, they split the, the ten tribes to the north. They're carried off into uh, Assyria. They're taken right into cap Gentile captivity. The Gentiles move into the north, and they pollute the, the, the nation. Judea, the southern kingdom, finally gets carried off into Babylonian captivity. And, uh, you know, when Cyrus says, you guys can go back into the land, they're going back in under Gentile rule and reign and so forth. And, but in the northern territory, look at verse 13. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum. Now, Capernaum is the northern end of the Sea of Galilee. Nazareth is no longer headquarters. Home, okay, now it's Capernaum. That's headquarters. Verse 14. That it might, I'm sorry, verse 13, dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the sea coast in the borders of Zebulon and Nephilim, uh, two of the tribes. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, and this is Isaiah 9, the first two verses. The land of Zebulon and the land of Nephilim, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. So they're underneath the control of who? The Gentiles, they're under the satanic captivity. The sat that, that's, he's tr Satan's trying to, to destroy Israel and therefore destroying God's purpose to use Israel in the earth. Where are they? They're in Galilee of the Gentiles. Verse 16, the, the people which sat in darkness saw great light. Darkness, spiritual darkness. They've rejected God's word. They've, they're under satanic captivity. He goes up there, and when he begins to call the little flock, they're coming, they're coming out of the grip of Satan, 
and they're coming out of the, the satanic captivity. They're under captivity politically as well as physically, but also now with the Lord spiritually, the spiritual blindness. Okay? And he says, And to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. So that's where he goes and gets and begins to call out that little flock. Now, if you come back to Isaiah and you, and you see this, it, it just, Isaiah 8, if you will. Isaiah 8. Isaiah 8. The quote's Isaiah 9, verse 1 and 2, but you've got to go back up into Isaiah 8 to catch what's happening here. Isaiah 8 and verse 18. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts which dwelleth in Mount Zion. Hebrews, John, all the God say that this is the Lord Jesus Christ and the little flock. Okay? And when they saw, and, and when they shall say unto you, seek unto them that have familiar spirits and under wizards that peep and mutter, should not a people seek under their God for the living to the dead. Okay, so spiritual darkness, what are they saying? We're seeking after, we're seeking after wizards that peep and mutter, Deuteronomy 13. We're seeking after things out here that are, in, uh, uh, that are against God's word, going against what God's word says to us. They're in spiritual apostasy. All right, verse 20, to the law and to the testimony. So they've got God's word. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So the light, they have God's word. The light that's coming into Israel is coming from God's word. Well, who is that? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the word. Now watch verse 21. And they shall pass through it, hardly uh, bestead and hungry. And it shall come to pass that when they shall be hungry, they shall fret themselves and curse their king and their God and look upward. And they shall look unto the earth and behold trouble and darkness, dimness of anguish, and they shall be driven into darkness. That is exactly what happens when you abandon God's word, period. No matter where you're at, you get driven into darkness. Spiritual darkness. Now watch 9.1. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation. When at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Nephila, and afterward did more grievously affect her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan and the Galilee of the nations. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death upon them hath the light shined. Well, there we are. Darkness. And yet, what do they see? They see light, the light of God's word. Now, watch verse 3. Thou hast multiplied the nations and not increased the joy. They joy before thee according to the joy and harvest, and as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. Now, verse 3 is a very interesting verse. You see the first colon. They has multiplied the nation and not increased the joy. That, for, that colon there signals that what he just talked about was the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. What's going on in the nation as Christ comes? They've multiplied, but there's no joy. Okay? Then his second coming is after that colon. They joy before thee according to the joy in the harvest, and as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. There's his second coming, as they are going to have joy and rejoicing where? In the kingdom, after they've had the battle. And the... It's interesting, by the way, in Isaiah, that the first coming and the second coming are often offset by a colon or a comma. It's very interesting going through, you'll see first coming, colon, Second coming, it's very fascinating. The point here, come back to Mark 16. The point in all of this 
is that Israel is in captivity. They're in satanic captivity. They're captive to Baal worship. They're in spiritual darkness. And Jesus Christ comes up there into, the, into Galilee, and he's going to shine the light. He provides light through the gospel of the kingdom. By the way, we didn't read that in Matthew 4. He said the next verse is, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's what he preached. That's the gospel of the kingdom. The little flock, the believers believe it. They're gathered together. They come out of Galilee, and they go with him. And again, you have to remember, what did he say to Israel's leaders? You have your father, the devil. He said, we have Abraham as our father. Well, physically, yeah, but not spiritually. Spiritually, you belong to Satan. So after the resurrection, he tells them, I'm going to meet you in Galilee. Now let go there. By the way, not in the temple, not in Jerusalem. I'm going to meet you where, where I called you from, where, where we all got started, back up north. So when you come back to 16.7, there's a lot of things happening in this little verse. <coughs> I'm going to meet you there in the, in the place where I called you out of the darkness into the light. The Lord literally has prepared everything. He's, got, he's, gotten, them, he's gotten everything in place in order to get them ready to go through the tribulation and into the kingdom. He doesn't say anything. There's no hesitation here. Notice in 7, it doesn't say, There shall you see him, uh, that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him after you deal with the apostle Paul and the Gentiles and the body of Christ. None of that. There's none of that activity, none of that. He's preparing them for the tribulation and into the kingdom. Acts 1, verse 3, he spends 40 days with them, teaching them the things pertaining to the kingdom. He's getting them ready. Matthew, the bulk of Matthew is a dispensational setting of them getting ready for the kingdom, the tribulation and the kingdom. So here, obviously, as he had said unto you, all along the way, his word is what they needed to be trusting. They needed to trust what he told them. What did he say? I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be rejected. I'm going to be tur turned over to the Gentiles and beat and scorned. They're going to kill me. I'm going to die. I'm going to be buried. And I'm going to rise the third day. And you know what happened? It's all been happening. He's, been, he's, he's kept his word. That's the point here. So verse 8, 16, 8, And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher, for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. I mean, they run. They don't tell anybody. The angel just said, go tell everybody, especially Peter, and they don't say nothing. <laughs> now, I, you, you scratch your head. I scratch my head about that. You know? Well, wouldn't you? you? Here they got this wonderful message, and it's almost like it, they're like, it's too good to be true. How could this? Ha no one's going to believe us when we say this. They're overwhelmed. See? Well, watch what happens, verse 9. Now, when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast. Now, notice, we go back to the resurrection, the morning of. And now we're gonna, he's going to talk to Mary Magdalene. And she went, out, went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and weeped. And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. Verse, verse 12, and after that he appeared in another form unto the two of them as they walked and went into the country. This is the two on the road. And they went and told it unto the, the residue, neither believed they them. So even when they were told, the disciples, they weren't ready to believe. So the ladies coming out, they don't go tell anybody. It's a hard thing to believe what we just heard. You can't blame them. 
I mean, if an angel showed up and said, boo, you know, hey, here's what's going on, you know, and you're not believing the word anyway, then they go. And again, last time we ended uh, talking briefly about the emphasis here by Mark on their unbelief. And again, the focus in on that is tremendously important. Now, go back up to verse 9, and let's talk about Mary Magdalene here. Because Mary Magdalene, in order to understand her, you need John 20, okay? To understand the two on the road, you need Luke 24. But watch what, how Mark does this. Now, when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene and out of whom he had cast seven devils. Here's a woman who was delivered from the devils, completely, totally liberated from the satanic captivity in picture. What is he going to do with Israel in the kingdom, Zechariah 12? He's going to liberate them completely from the unclean spirits. And you see the picture here with Mary Magdalene. Okay? She goes, tells them they don't believe. Actually, they mourn, they, she went and told them, verse 10, that had been with him as they mourned and wept, and they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believe not. Again, the hammering in, the focus in on that. Then verse 12. After that, he appeared in another form unto the two of them as they walked and went into the country, and they went and told it unto the residue, the, the rest of the folks, and neither believed they them. Now, come on over to Luke, but, but think about the two on the road. They're consumed in their loss. Uh, Luke 24. You see, they're consumed with their loss of their own expectation. They expected him to be their redeemer. Luke 24, 21, they say, but we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. See, and beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. See, they thought, so they're mourning their loss. So you begin with Mary Magdalene, the first appearance. Look at Luke 24, 25. Okay, so you begin with Mary Magdalene and her, the first, this picture of Israel being completely liberated from the unclean spirits, and then you deal with the two on the road, and they're de completely dealing with their loss. Verse 25, then said he unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. They, they, and again, they're consumed with their loss. And what Mark does, again, Mark's assuming that you have Luke and John and you know what he's talking about. He's quick to just hit it and run. Okay? So, obviously, Luke and John are on the table. You know, Mar Peter, I'm sorry, Paul in uh, 1 Timothy 5 quotes Luke and Deuteronomy about the ox and, and the uh, worthy of his hire and all that. So obviously Paul had Luke in front of him. So Luke has been written, collated, copied, verified to be scripture by the office of the prophets and everything. And it's right there. He had it. Same with the Old Testament. So when you come back to Mark 16, Luke here, he just hits these things and keeps moving. But the picture is painted. And the picture is painted here of understanding that little flock has, there's some things going on here that they need to pay attention to. Now, look at verse 14. Luke, I'm sorry, Mark 16, 14. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and unbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. Now, that's the point here. And this is why the focus on their unbelief is so important. He meets with them. 
He unbraided them for their, with their unbelief. He's chastising them, okay? He, he's, uh, you know, as a dad, you have to chastise, deal, you know, discipline the children. And that's, he's getting after them about their unbelief. And why it's here in Mark, again, the suffering servant, the suffering servant of Jehovah, however, you, you know, here is Jesus' servant. What, what Mark is doing here is he's, you have to understand their unbelief is very, th- this, this record of their unbelief is very important because it has a direct bearing on the value of their subsequent belief concerning his resurrection. Okay, the record of their unbelief at the reports of his resurrection are a validation of the later of their later conviction that he is risen. Early Acts, you see Peter all about the resurrection. Boom, boom, boom on it. No heart of unbelief there. See? If they are willing to suffer the assault, the persecution, the death, the trouble, all based upon the fact that they are testifying, they are the witnesses to what? His resurrection. That means this unbelief over here, you know what that means? It wasn't a hoax. It wasn't a made-up story. Because a hoax you don't believe in because they do believe over here. So their unbelief over here is a validation of their later come that this really happened. It's not a hoax. It's not made up. They saw him. They're validating. and what? So they come from unbelief to conviction, so much so that they're facing death. And it's the fact, the reason that they move that is it's what? It's real. It really happened. So the value here in Mark is they know he was risen, but based upon the fact that they didn't expect him to be risen. The ladies go, Peter and John go, they're expecting to find him dead laid out. They get there, he's not here, he's risen. They were shocked. When these ladies show up about Hey, who's going to roll the sepulcher? Who's going to roll the stone? And they get there and they're like, okay, where'd he go? Remember, and and, uh, Mary goes, asks the gardener, who is really the Lord, where'd you put him? You just tell him, I'll go get him. See, they're not expecting him to be gone, to be risen. So their unbelief does what? Validates their belief over here, and it goes hand in hand. Now, you'll notice in verse 14, the eleven, as they sat at meat. Okay, now come over to Acts 1. Well, you know, yeah, uh, Acts 1. Let, let's, let's just look here for a second. Acts 1, verse 3. The confidence of, of his resurrection. The confidence that we have in the death, burial, and resurrection. His burial confirms that he's dead. Peter dema- or Pilate demanded a death certificate from the centurion, and he got it. If you deny that the Lord died, then you're denying a governmental death certificate that is inaccurate. Okay? Notice in verse 3, Acts 1, verse 3. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passions by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom. He validated the infallible proofs. One of them is he's being seen. In 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, Paul talks about he, he was dead, buried in resurrection. Verse 5, and was seen of. See? So, not only death, burial, and resurrection, but seen of. See, no one expected his resurrection. He was seen of Peter, then the 12, then 500, and last of all, Paul. By the way, 
Peter, the twelve, and the five hundred were all his friends. Who was Saul of Tarsus? His enemy. See, Saul, Paul, would have done everything in his, his power to keep him dead. And yet, he's one born out of due time. That violent birth is there. So now, the, their confidence there, it's, he was seen. The proof is, is right there. Now, he was seen of the eleven. Uh, this is what gets interesting in this. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat. Now, get Luke 24. We're going to get 1 Corinthians 15, John 20, and Luke 24. But we'll just do them slow. Luke 24. You guys with the tablets and the, you know, you got to, I just roll them over, you know, bend the page. But Luke 24. Just notice this issue here, Luke 24, 36. And as they spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and, suspo and supposed that they had seen a spirit. So here he's appearing to who? Mark 16, 14, the 11. All right, now come over to John 20. John 20. John 20. Verse 19, John 20, 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for the fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. All right, so Mark 16, right? Are you sure? There's 11 of them there. Well, verse 24. And Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So wait a minute. It wasn't the eleven. It was ten. Or was it eleven? Or was it the twelve? Well, we know twelve's the number, but one's dead. Judas is dead. But then we still got this eleven. Now we got ten, and we got eleven. Now come over to 1 Corinthians 15, because watch Paul. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. So you've got this thing here that's happening with this number that's really fascinating. Because, again, we have to have 12 apostles. 11 are alive. Judas is dead. But then when he gets together with them, Thomas wasn't there. So really there's 10. But Mark 16 clearly said 11. So Mark 16 is recognizing Judas's absence, yet Thomas wasn't there. So then why 11? You follow? Okay. Now watch 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. Well, wait a minute. Paul confirms twelve. But who's the twelve? You see, the twelve is the whole... It, it's like when we say the Sanhedrin or the Sadducee. It's the whole group. The, that twelve is the whole group. Okay? So between resurrection and ascension... What happened? Do you remember? A little guy by the name of Matthias happened. Go to Acts 1. And just notice what Paul is doing here in 1 Corinthians 15. By the way, he's seen of above 500. Then he's seen of James. Then of all the apostles. And then he's seen of Paul. See, So between the resurrection and the ascension... They need to get the 12 back. That's what Peter's doing here. By the way, Peter's doing this prior to being filled with the Holy Spirit. Acts 2 hadn't happened yet. Verse 26. Well, verse 24. I'm sorry. Acts 1, 24. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen. Past, that's past. It's already been done. In the mind of the Holy Spirit, Matthias is 
the 12th apostle. He just hasn't been officially elected to the position. Judas is gone. Okay, he's dead. But the 11 sit there. Wait a minute, Didymus, Thomas isn't there, but there's 11 sitting in that room. Because who's sitting there? Matthias. And in the eyes of the Holy Spirit, who's, he's already in that place. Verse 26, and they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11. So Matthias's place is among the... He, he, he takes that, by the way, if you read verse 25, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell. You see the comma? That he might go to his own place. And usually what people say is Judas has a special place in hell, and that is not the case. What the case is, is Matthias taking his place. Matthias is now gaining the rightful position in the twelve as Judas's replacement, okay? So Judas, Matthias's placing as one of the 12 was already in place. So he was already considered to be after the resurrection, all right? Now, prior to the resurrection, not so, because Judas has to go do his thing. What does Judas do? He betrays him, and he goes out and kills himself. And then in God's mind, the Holy Spirit, Matthias is already in place, because what's coming? Wrath, kingdom, we got to be ready. Peter, that's what Peter's doing in Acts 1. Guys, we need to have 12 of us, so let's do this. Peter doesn't know that, but Mark 16, when he says he's with the 12, we know from John that Thomas isn't there. Now, if Thomas had been there, what number would it have been? 12. Paul, by the way, he was seen of the 12, confirms Matthias being in the place because it's after the resurrection. See, Paul confirms this out here that it's, he's already there. He's, he just hasn't gone through the election process. He's already, on, he's already in. You follow that? Did that make any sense? Okay. Because what happens is, is they use that in Mark 16 to say this is one of the reasons why this should not be in your Bible is because they, your King James Bible can't get the numbering right. Because is it, 11, is it 12, is it 11, or is it 10? And they run the verses we just ran, and it, except for Acts 1. They stay out of Acts 1, okay? And then they come down here in a minute in Acts 16, or Mark 16, and they don't know how to handle the snakes, and they don't know how to handle the deadly things, so they just say, this is all hooey and hoaxy and fairy tales, so we just jettison that out. Now, we're going to go through it. The next time, we'll look at why. Uh, it's being omitted and how to handle it, and then we're not going to run through this stuff, okay? Just catch what's happening here. Ladies, you go tell the, the scattered sheep, especially Peter, because Peter is in the, he's in the, he's depressed. No self-esteem, no self-respect, no, you go deal with Pete. They go to tell, and nobody will believe him. He goes to Mary Magdalene, Picture of the little flock completely restored and set up into the kingdom. No one believes her. He goes to the two, to, two on the road, a picture of they're, they're just consumed with their loss. No one believes them. He sits them down. He gets on them for their unbelief. But their unbelief is important because it validates the fact that then when they do believe that the resurrection was never a hoax. It was true. It was real. It was legitimate. And who validates it is, is the whole company of the apostles. Peter's not there yet. I'm sorry, Thomas isn't there, but they're all there in the end, okay? Now, I could have said all that in the beginning, and we'd have been done early, but it's much more fun to go through the verses, okay? All right. Whew, lock packed in that hour. Okay, dear Holy Father, we thank you for the evening, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the look into the details around your resurrection and the things that happen here with the believers their response, the impact of your resurrection had on them, and the fact that in the end uh, they were rejoicing with you. In your name we pray, amen.